Good morning. Allow me to welcome you to chapel where two or three are gathered together. Here he is in our midst. Uh, when you decide to hold chapel on Day of the Bear, uh, this is what you get. Uh, I am grateful that any number are joining us online and that our time today will be saved for posterity and we will have the opportunity to share this chapel with any number of people digitally for which we're grateful. I not only want to welcome those who are here and those who are joining us online, but I would like to invite you to pray with me. Let's all pray. Our Lord and our God, we say with the psalmist of old, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the place of worship. Lord, in the midst of a life that is full to overflowing, in the midst of the press and the pressures, we pause afresh and anew to say, we love you and we want to be still and know you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of worship this day. For those who will lead, we pause to say that we're grateful. Lord, on this day, our hearts are heavy. They're heavy for those who've been affected by natural disaster in Mississippi and by senseless shooting in Nashville. We say with the psalmist, how long, O Lord, how long? We're mindful each day of our own brokenness. And we're no less mindful that this is a good world that so frequently, not unlike sheep, goes astray and loses its way. And so we say, God, through our prayers, through our worship, Will you comfort? Will you intervene? Will you reconcile? Will you begin to make your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Allow this worship, our worship this day, to be a gift to you because we give you back the life we owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Amen. Good morning. Today's first scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus said his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone who brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through his, which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Caper Capernaum with, the mother of brother, with his mothers and brothers and disciples. There they stayed for a few days. This is the word of the Lord. We stand as we sing this morning. We're going to sing Firm Foundation. The words are printed in your order of worship. And then we will sing hymn number 349, To God Be the Glory. Christ is my firm foundation. Sweet. 
To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life, atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Today's scripture comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4 through 10. For everything good created is good. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. All right, good morning, everyone. I have the honor and privilege to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Paul Putz. Now, most of you probably know this, but Paul Putz is the Assistant Director for the Faith and Sports Institute and the Program Director for Truett's Master of, the of Arts in Theology and Sports Study degree. Paul is married to Bethany, and they have three kids who I'm sure keep them very busy, Leighton, Lyndon, and Lewison. They went with the L theme there. <laughs> Both Bethany and Paul grew up as pastor's kids in small town Nebraska. Paul went on to play small college basketball before entering into a career in education where he brought his passion for sports with him. He holds a PhD in history and specializes in the study of sports, Christianity, and American culture. His first book, titled The Spirit of the Game, Christian Athletes, Big Time Sports, and Transformation of American Protestantism, is under contract with Oxford University Press. He fr also frequently writes for online publications, including Christianity Today, Slate, and Religion and Politics, and he has been interviewed as an expert on sports and Christianity by, by the New York Times, Associated Press, Sports Illustrated, National Public R Radio, and more. Today, he brings us a message titled, Jesus and James Naismith, the Christian history of basketball and its lessons for the church today. So please help me welcome Dr. Paul Putz. Thanks for the introduction, Abby. And thank you for being with us here at Truett Seminary or online. As Abby told you, I'm a historian. I'm not a preacher, but my dad was a preacher. So I've probably got a little bit of that in me. And today, I'm going to suggest that history can preach to us. And that in the example of a game invented 130 years ago, we can see Christians living out ideas that were expressed in the biblical passages that Katie and Pat read a few moments ago. More about that in a second. First, I want to take you back to that very first game of basketball. It happened in 1891, on a December day in Springfield, Massachusetts. At 11.30 a.m. that day, 18 grown men, most of them 25 years old, walked into the gym at the International Young Men's Christian Association Training School, where they were students. They would have noticed two peach baskets tacked to banisters on opposite sides of the gym, 10 feet off the ground. There was a soccer ball, too, and a list of 13 rules for a new game that their instructor, James Naismith, explained to them. 
The students divided into two teams of nine and the game commenced. There was no dribbling, no jump shots, no dunking. Instead, the men passed the soccer ball back and forth, trying to keep it away from their opponents while angling for a chance to throw it into the basket. With no template for what a shot was supposed to look like, the students would position the ball at the top of their head, prepping themselves to toss it toward the basket, only to find that just when they were ready to throw the ball in, a defender would swoop in and grab it away, leaving the player to turn around in surprise. If you've ever tried to coach second graders, like I have, it was probably a scene like that, except with bigger players with beards. By the time that the class and the game had ended, just one person made a shot. The final score of the first basketball game was one to zero. To the students who played the game and to Naismith, however, it was a success. The students loved the thrill and challenge and creative possibilities of the game. Naismith loved those parts too, but there was something else about it that he loved. For him, it represented the very reason he was at the YMCA training school in the first place. He enrolled in the new college out of a belief that sports and physical education could be a place for spiritual formation. On his application to the school, he was asked to describe the role that he would be training for, and he described it this way, to win men for the master through the gym. When Naismith created basketball then, the game was part of this much larger vision, inspired by his Christian faith, nurtured at a Christian college, shaped by Christian ideas, and distributed around the world through a global Christian network. Basketball was profoundly influenced by Christianity. I told you earlier that I thought history could preach to us, so in that spirit, I want to present to you three points today, three lessons that basketball can teach the church. Point number one, basketball is about the people that we are becoming. When Naismith wrote on his application that he wanted to win men for the master through the gym, he didn't have a vision of platform evangelism or using celebrity athletes to promote Jesus. His idea of Christian witness was about forming and shaping people to exhibit the character of Christ in their everyday lives. And sports like basketball, he thought, could be a place where that could happen. In Naismith's day, this understanding of sport was relatively new. Naismith grew up in rural Canada. His parents both died of an illness when he was nine years old. And so his uncle Peter, a deeply religious Presbyterian, took him in. Peter made sure that Naismith was connected and involved with the Presbyterian Church. But when Naismith was 15, he dropped out of high school. He spent some time as a lumberjack, returned to high school at age 20, and entered into college with the goal, inspired by his uncle Peter, of becoming a Christian minister. In Naismith's experience in the Presbyterian Church growing up, most Christians saw sports as a di diversion or as a tool of the devil. They were people who read 1 Timothy 4.8, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value in all things, and they saw in that passage mutually exclusive domains, one physical and one spiritual. The truly committed Christians in their minds would focus on spiritual tasks and vocations. After Naismith started playing football while he was a seminary student, a group of his Christian friends began meeting together to pray for his soul. Now, to be fair to Naismith's friends, I've prayed for Brian Gamble's soul, trying to deliver him from Duke basketball fandom. So perhaps we can relate. But Naismith was also coming of age during a time when a new movement was taking shape in England and North America, a movement scholars have labeled muscular Christianity. There's a lot that can be said about this complex movement, the main point I want to make today is that muscular Christians pushed back against a dualistic understanding of the world, one that pitted sacred against secular, that elevated the unseen spiritual world over the physical and the material. Muscular Christians suggested that we should see the sacred value of our physical bodies, that we should see human beings in a holistic way, mind, body, and soul intertwined. 
Muscular Christians could look at a verse like 1 Timothy 4.8 and instead of seeing mutually exclusive activities, physical training or spiritual training, they saw the potential that all things, including physical training, could provide an opportunity for training in godliness. It was not either or. Instead, it was about the intentionality with which we pursue our activities in everyday life. This came home for Naismith in a story he pointed to as his epiphany. It happened while he was a seminary student playing football, perhaps at the very moment that his friends were praying for his soul. During one game, in the middle of an intense moment of action, the guard to Naismith's left lost his temper and let out a stream of curse words. At a break in action, the guard sheepishly turned to Naismith. I beg your pardon, I forgot you were there, he said. Naismith was surprised at first. He had never spoken out against profanity. He never mentioned it. He had been a lumberjack. He was used to coarse language. It took him some time to reflect, and then a light bulb went off. His teammate felt compelled to apologize because he respected the fact that, in Naismith's words, I played the game with all my might and yet held myself under control. The teammate was responding, in other words, to the type of person Naismith was in ordinary, everyday life, to the consistency and integrity of Naismith's character displayed on and off the field. Soon after that encounter, Naismith heard about the YMCA training school in Springfield, a new college that would train leaders who could connect sports and physical activity with Christian formation. He submitted his application, and away he went to the United States, where he created basketball, a game that Naismith hoped would provide opportunities for players to grow and develop as whole people. The aim of basketball, Naismith said, is to develop the man. In our churches and Christian communities today, it seems to me this is a crucial need. We focus on metrics and influence and results. We pursue power and fame. We seem more interested in hearing a famous person say the name of Jesus on television than we are informing women and men who live the way of Jesus in their everyday lives. The first and most important lesson basketball has for us today, I think, is to call our attention to the slow work of Christian formation. If basketball was designed to provide a space for developing and forming people, the next question is how do we set people up for that formation? What conditions need to be in place? This brings us to our second lesson. Basketball valued both freedom and boundaries. Naismith believed strongly in individual expression, the freedom to try new things. He wanted basketball players to have the space to create, to be able to take the initiative. He gloried in the inventive new moves, the improvisations that players developed, like the dribble and the hook shot. He often expressed awe and wonder as he witnessed the ever-advancing skill of basketball players over the course of his life. Naismith's appreciation for players led him to take a more skeptical view of coaches. With apologies to Joel Heiser, my high school basketball coach. I don't want to throw shade at you, but Naismith had some concerns. He understood the value of the coach, but he worried that they tended to overcoach, that they pursued victory at the expense of developing people. A coach could drill his players or her players to follow orders and win plenty of games, but this created dependence rather than independence. It turned players, Naismith warned, into cogs in a machine rather than broad and independent young men and women. As Naismith wrote in his autobiography, why should the play of a group of young men be entirely spoiled to further the ambitions of some coach? At the same time, Naismith didn't want to simply roll out the ball and set up a free-for-all. His favorite role in the game of basketball was not the player, certainly not the coach. It was the referee. To Naismith, the referee was the central figure creating the conditions in which moral development could occur. Games, he wrote, have been called the laboratory for the development of moral attributes, but they will not, in and of themselves, accomplish this purpose. They must be properly conducted by competent individuals. 
This was especially important because Naismith designed basketball to provide intense competition without brute force. Basketball, Naismith said, is personal combat without personal contact. This requires a high degree of discipline. Players on both teams can move anywhere on the floor at any time. They can literally get nose to nose with their opponent, but they cannot overpower them with physical contact. The only way to enforce this is through consistent application of the rules. A well-regulated game sets the players up for both the joy of playing and the possibility of moral development. The balance Naismith struck here between prioritizing creative freedom of the individual while also setting specific boundaries for the good of the players seems relevant today. There seem to be two different and potentially destructive cultural forces pulling and pushing the church. On the one hand, we have some who believe in unfettered individual expression and the limitless potential of human beings to do anything, say anything, become anything. Here, the burden of carrying a million choices can easily turn to anxiety and despair, a feeling that one is never quite good enough. It can lead to a restlessness that the next option, the next choice will be the one that brings happiness. It can turn to pride, a sense that I've created the life that I want all by myself. But on the other hand, we have some who adopt a response to this individualism that can be even more damaging. Fearing chaos, they search for dogmatic certainty and commit themselves to regimes that prioritize submission to hierarchy and absolute authority. Here, deference to authority easily leads to toxic systems that heap privileges on the powerful and allow abuses to go unchecked, while those who call out and name the abuses are deemed traitors or unfaithful or worse. In Naismith's vision for basketball, we see a way to navigate these cultural conditions, to become a people who are playful, creative, expressive, and yet people who recognize the need for boundaries, limits, and structure. The key is that the limits we recognize and the boundaries we set up must never be for the sake of the limits themselves, nor for the sake of the people who have the power to set and shape those limits. They must always be for the sake of the flourishing of human beings. Few things are worse in a basketball game than a referee who makes the game about themselves. If you start paying attention to a referee, chances are something has gone wrong. The best referees are those who operate in a quiet way, whose presence is barely felt, whose service gives them no special privileges, except the knowledge that they help to create an environment in which players could experience the joy of the game and develop their potential more fully. This brings us to our third and final lesson. Basketball's early development demonstrates the value of pluralistic work for the common good. A way of being in American society that John Inazu has called confident pluralism. So far, I've had a lot of good things to say about basketball's history, but the truth is that the sport was also birthed in a culture and within institutions that were shaped by notions of racial and gender superiority. Many muscular Christians, including many who collaborated with Naismith, believed that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were the pinnacle of civilization. They believed it was the task of supposedly enlightened white men to assimilate other people groups into Anglo-American cultural norms. This assimilation could take many forms. Sometimes it took violence and coercion. Naismith was able to resist many of these tendencies, perhaps because he was an outsider, he was an orphan, a high school dropout, an immigrant to the United States. He valued women's participation in basketball. And to give another example, in the 1930s, while Naismith was a professor at the University of Kansas, a student named John McClendon enrolled at the school. McClendon was an African-American. He wanted to join, to join the basketball team. But he could not because at the time, Kansas did not allow black players to participate in sports. Naismith was not the basketball coach, but he was a physical education professor. And so he took McClendon under his wing. He mentored the young coaching prodigy. John McClendon would go on to become one of the most accomplished and important basketball coaches of the 20th century. 
thanks in part to Naismith's mentorship. But Naismith is not the hero of this particular aspect of basketball's story. The important thing to know is that it was never just a Christian game developed by Naismith. It was always also from the beginning a game influenced and shaped by a variety of people from different backgrounds and different identities. It crossed gendered lines. In 1892, a woman named Senda Berenson, serving as an instructor at a woman's college in Massachusetts, heard about this new game. She went to check it out. At the time, there was essentially no team sport deemed acceptable for women. Their opportunities to compete and play in any sport were severely limited. But Berenson saw in basketball a chance to change that. She brought the game back to her college. She developed new rules. And thanks to her efforts and many other women, it quickly became the most popular and important women's team sport in the 20th century. As a woman, Senda Berenson was already moving the game beyond its muscular Christian origins. But she was also Jewish. And basketball quickly became a favorite sport for the Jewish community. Providing uh, the game, the Jewish community provided the game with many of its early stars and innovators. Other faith traditions embraced basketball as well. Catholics and Latter-day Saints. Basketball crossed racial and ethnic lines too. At the time that Naismith created basketball, the YMCA was racially segregated. There were some black YMCA chapters, but they often lacked the resources to build gym spaces where basketball could be played. With little help from the white Christians who developed basketball, African Americans had to create their own spaces to play, and they did. In New York City, black churches played a central role in this development. They provided the gym space and sponsored some of the earliest teams, helping to build a thriving culture of black basketball that shaped New York City and beyond. In Washington, D.C., another hub of black basketball, it was Edwin E. B. Henderson who was the key figure. Later nicknamed the grandfather of black basketball, Henderson decided to create a black basketball league after he was kicked out of a whites-only YMCA gym. Naismith supported and cheered on the efforts of Berenson, Henderson, and others, but he was not actively involved. And that's why basketball's early development can help us appreciate the possibilities of a pluralistic society. We don't need to sacrifice conviction. Naismith remained a Presbyterian throughout his life, committed to the Christian faith. But we do need to cultivate two other traits to go along with our conviction. We need, as theologian Reinhold Niebuhr put it, both humility and charity. Humility helps us recognize where our own faith traditions have fallen short, where they've sinned. Looking back to the white Christian institutions of Naismith's day, this is especially apparent when it comes to race. Charity helps us recognize and appreciate the positive contributions to the common good that other faith traditions offer in our shared life together. Basketball would not be the game we know and love today if it had not developed in a collaborative and inclusive way, if it had not been embraced by a multitude of people across a variety of faith traditions. For Naismith and for us, basketball is not something to claim as special property. It is a gift released into the world for all to enjoy. Later in his life, when he was asked to discuss basketball's origins, Naismith reflected to his mission in life. And here's what he said about his life's mission. I'm going to quote here extensively from him. He said, Way back in my college days, I was lying on bed one Sunday and thought, What is this all about? What is life about? What are you going to do? What are you going to be? What motto will you hold up before you? I put on my wall, not in writing, but in my mind, this thought. I want to leave the world a little better than I found it. That is the motto I had then, and it is the motto I have today. That has been a mighty fine thing for me. In our society today, I think we need more Christians with this view in mind. Working to build creative, and constructive and collaborative spaces, 
not for our own recognition, not so that we can point the finger to ourselves and ask for applause. Yes, there is an imperative to tell other people about the hope that is within us, and those opportunities will come. But there's also a need to be the kind of people who humbly serve the common good. The Gospel of John tells us that when Jesus turned the water into wine, everyone enjoyed it, even if not everyone knew the source. Basketball encourages us to ask, what gifts for the good of the world can we create together? So we have a focus on the slow work of Christian formation, on structured freedom that promotes human flourishing, on confident pluralism for the common good. These are three lessons from basketball's Christian history I think we can use as Christians today. I'd like to close with one more story about Naismith, and this is one of my favorites. It happened in the 1920s, more than three decades after basketball's creation, when Naismith stopped by a small college in Iowa. He dropped into a gym, anonymously and quietly, to pass the time. Two teams were set to play a pickup game, and they decided a referee was needed. One player ran over to Naismith sitting in the bleachers and asked if he would officiate. But before Naismith could reply, a second player interrupted. That old man? He doesn't know anything about basketball. Let's get someone else. Off the players went to find a different referee, while Naismith smiled with a twinkle in his eye. He didn't need people to recognize him. He just loved that the game was being played and enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Putz. That was awesome. We all stand as we sing one more song together in our chapel time today. We're going to worship by singing the blessing. The words are printed in your order of worship. The Lord bless you.
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the, ra the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Go in peace. Thank you. <laughs>